Doug Lewis S. <laughs> Where are we tying today? We've been announcing it for days. Well, maybe not days, a day. Uh, today we're going to tie a woolly bugger. And yes, it's a very simple pattern. And it's the pattern that probably most of you tied the first time. But there are some subtleties to tying what I feel is a good woolly bugger. I mean, um, you know, you can tie them all sorts of ways. Um, and you can tie them with all sorts of materials and with lots and lots of colors. Um, but let me, let me tell you a little bit about the woolly bugger before we start. And then we'll talk about material selection a little bit. Um, the woolly bugger was developed by a gentleman named Russell Blessing, the late Russell Blessing, who lived in Pennsylvania. And he was a friend of Barry Beck. And um, they were fishing together one day, and uh, there was a trico hatch. And when the trico hatch was over, uh, Russell was just catching these fish left and right. And Barry said, what have you got on? And, and Russell showed him, and, and Russell ab admitted to Barry that all he did was take a woolly worm, which is a classic old pattern that's been around probably for a couple hundred years, and put a marabou tail on it. He tied it in black, and he used it to imitate halgermites for smallmouth bass. And um, Barry at the time was uh, a commercial tire for Orvis. And um, Barry did an article in Fly Fisherman magazine on this fly. And, of course, this was pre-internet days, and Fly Fisherman or a couple of other magazines, Field and Stream, were, were the, the places that you got information about hot new stuff. And... The fly went crazy, and Barry subsequently got an order for 150 dozen woolly buggers, which is more a bigger order than he had ever gotten before. So, um, Russell Blessing passed away a number of years ago. He was a very modest man. He never made any claims about the woolly bugger, and uh, Barry was the mainly the one who publicized it. But um, it's just a great fly. You can catch everything from. A blue, literally a bluegill to a tarpon on. I have caught so many different species of fish on a woolly bugger. Um, and, you know, people say the clouser minnow, which we're going to tie later in the week, is a fly that you can catch almost every species of fish on. But the woolly bugger is cool because you can even dead drift it like a nymph, which you can't really do that well with a, with a clouser minnow. So um, the woolly bugger is just a great fly no matter how no matter how you tie it. And I'm gonna show you a few variations of woolly buggers. I've got a bunch here I've been tying. You guys think I just sit down and, and, and tie a woolly bugger, but I've been practicing all weekend. I wanna make sure that I get this right. So um, thank you, thank you all for uh, letting me restock my fly box with woolly buggers, because I needed some. Anyway, so um, you can tie them, how's that look? I'm looking at the screen here. There's a little delay. I want to make sure that you can see this. Okay, should I hold a little closer? You can tie them small and light. This is a tan woolly bugger with a bead head, and um, I've been really, I've been really successful with that one, as successful as I ever get. And I also, um, in the smaller ones, like uh, little brown ones. And again, these are deadly, dead drifted to imitate a. A helgramite or a big stone flying them for something. We that have a comment that it's hard to hear. Hard to hear? How's that? Is that better? Am I just not speaking loudly enough? How's the volume for the rest of you now? Good? Okay. All right. Um, here's one with a var variegated marabou, and you probably can't see that, but a variegated uh, chenille body and, and a dyed brown grizzly Grizzly hackle. Um, here's one that I tied with a barred marabou and a bead head. So, you know, various sizes. But one of the things I would urge you never to be without. I'm going to pull one out here. Which are my go-to. Where are they? There. One of the things, how's the volume? Is it better? Says it's better. Okay. Uh, one of the things I would never go without is a really tiny black woolly bugger. Um, you can dead drift them. They're great as a stonefly imitation. Uh, they're great fished as a streamer. And the nice thing about a little one like this 
is let's say you're fishing a four weight rod or even a three weight and you decide you want to put a streamer on you don't want to put one of those big ones on uh, but you can you can fish a little tiny woolly bugger and have really good success with that so um, what size do you consider small for big by bugger? small I would say a 10 or a 12 you could even go smaller you could tie one on a uh, I don't think you can get a, th a 4x long 14 hook but you could go you could tie it as small as a size 14 uh, or 16 even on a uh, on a 3x long nymph hook uh, wouldn't have exactly the right proportions but you could do that Mandy says it looks like a burnt chicken nugget it looks like a burnt chicken <laughs> nugget yeah it sure does it's, it's not a thing of beauty Randy that's for sure <laughs> all right any other questions um, uh, not yet. Okay, so let's talk about materials before we start. Um, first and foremost is marabou. Cause that's the that's the magic part of this fly. Marabou comes in lots of different uh, degrees of fuzziness and length. Okay, what you want if you can get it is blood marabou or woolly bugger marabou. It's called blood plume marabou. And as you can see by looking at this thing, it's really fuzzy, okay? It's fuzzy all the way to the tip. And that gives you, you see that, okay? That gives you a really good, a really good action on that fly. Now, there's other, Marabou, if you buy a big pack of marabou, you might get something like this. And you notice how, how slim the tips are and it's, it's not as fuzzy and it's not going to give you as big a profile. Um, this is okay. What you need to do is combine two or maybe three of these to get enough bulk. You know, you want that, you want that tail to be, you want that tail to be fairly bulky because this is going to slim down in the water and you don't want it too skinny you know it's, it's going to slim down to about like that you want you want to have some wiggle in there can you move um, the material to your right a little bit move the tail to my right hold the material more to your right that's what matthew's asking over here i'm not sure how's that better oh i see okay and are you better off using tungsten cone head or lead free wrap uh, we're going to get into that, but I like both tungsten, tungsten cone and a little bit of lead free wrap. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tie one woolly bugger, really straightforward, basic for those of you who want to see the basic woolly bugger. And then I'll tie another one that's got a few more bells and whistles. So we'll tie a couple of them today and um, I'll show you a couple things that you can, you can add to your woolly bugger and make them a little bit better. Um, so that's the marabou and you know if you have marabou sometimes you'll have marabou that's uneven or it's nice and fuzzy down in here and it's too thin up there what you can do is you can take that marabou and you can pinch it and pluck it and what that does is it'll get rid of those it'll get rid of those ends that you don't want on there but you won't it won't look chopped off like you'd cut it with a pair of scissors. So if it's uneven, just grab it with your fingernail and, and pluck it and trim it. And then you can get a little bit, a little bit nicer uh, bunch of marabou. Okay. So the other, the other material is chenille. And you may, there's two different types of chenille, basically. This is, called ultra chenille or vernille and this is what is mostly available today um, it's very dense it's very fine um, and um, you can't expose the threads on the end of it like you can ordinary chenille so you have to just kind of tie it in by itself now this is old-fashioned chenille and some of you probably have some of this. I have lots of it, and I still use it. Um, 
you can tell if it's old fashioned chenille because it doesn't look totally round. It's it's kind of flat and it has sides to it. And uh, I'm going to use this old fashioned chenille uh, today uh, to show you how to how to work with that. Hey, okay. I have a question. Yeah. Question. Okay. Brian asks, if not weighted, how is this fished? Strip just below the surface, or use a sink tip to get it lower. The answer is yes, Brian. You fish it lots of ways. Uh, I fish, if I night fish, I fish a totally unweighted woolly bugger, just swung just below the surface. If, uh, if I have an unweighted woolly bugger and I want to get down deeper, because I think maybe the water's too fast or the fish are deeper, then I'll put a, a sink tip or uh, a po sinking poly, lead, poly leader on it. And if worse comes to worse, just pinch a split shot right at the head of your woolly bugger or, or on the leader. Um, there's no difference between pinching a split shot right at the head of your woolly bugger and tying a bead head, right? So uh, you, can do it, you can do it lots of ways. Uh, that's the beauty of the woolly bugger. You can fish it all different ways and you have to look at the conditions and you have to let the fish tell you what the right way is, okay? All right, so any questions about the different kinds of chenille, two different kinds of chenille? I don't see anything. No questions. All right. No questions. Then we have hackle. And, oh, I gotta grab something here. Off to the side. Sorry about that. I wasn't quite prepared with all of my kinds of hackle. So this is this is what's called strung saddle hackle, and um, it's it's strung with uh, it's strung on a piece of uh, piece of cloth, and it keeps it nice and organized. You can also buy saddle hackle just stuffed in a bag. Um, sometimes it's strung like this. This is particularly nice saddle hackle. Um, I like my hackle to have a little bit of web down the middle of it. What I mean by web is, I'm well, not sure if you can see this feather, but you'll, you, if you can see, if you can look at this feather, you can see that there is a, a central area that's kind of dull and opaque, and then there's a shiny outer area to all those feathers. I like to see some of that web in there. It gives the fly a little bit more action. Um, so you, you want a question? Yeah, a few questions. Um, okay, questions? Can I use copper wire as a weight? Don't ask me, can I use this and can I use that? You can use anything you want. <laughs> you don't need my permission, okay? Cop, you can use copper wire for a weight. It's not going to give you as much, uh, as much weight, uh, but you can. If you don't have any... Uh, if you don't have any non-toxic uh, metal wire or you don't have any uh, tungsten cones or beads, you can use a brass bead or a cone. You can use copper wire, but you're not going to get as much, you're not going to get as much sink rate. You can also pinch a split shot onto the head of the thing when you, either when you tie it or after you tie it. So um, there is no right or wrong, okay? There's no right or wrong. You can use anything you want. There's a few more questions. Okay, a few more questions. Um, is medium size chenille best? Uh, John? It depends on the size fly you're tying. I use medium for uh, size four through probably eight, and then I go to small in uh, you know tens and twelves. Okay, Larry asks, I'm a little confused regarding how to use that new type of chenille that he mentioned. Maybe when he gets to that part of tying it on. Uh, it, it's all pretty much tied the same. It's just when you tie it, it's all wound the same. When you tie it in, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a difference in the newer type of chenille. We'll go through that. Thoughts on using, oh, I don't even know what this is, schlappen as hackle? Uh, schlappen as hackle is very webby. Yeah, it's usually too big for the sizes that we're tying. Um, I have, I have a woolly bugger tied with very webby. Uh, I tied one, here's one with, not quite slopping, but um, 
pretty webby hackle and you can see it's, it's webby almost down to the base. Uh, just a little bit different, a uh, little bit different uh, appearance and it probably wiggles a little bit more in the water. Um, but a slopping, I think, is going to be is going to be too big for most patterns. What is the best fish for this pattern? What is the best what? Fish. What is the best fish for this pattern? Like who likes it? Who likes it? <laughs> Everybody likes it. Everybody likes it. Trout, bass, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, bass, uh, all species of trout, striped bass, tarpon. Okay, Rhea asks, does putting split shot above the fly at the head to add weight affect the action of the fly at all, or is it dependent at all on the root tree? Uh, it will affect the action. It will make it. It will make it dive. It will make it act like a jig, which is which is. But it's going to be the same as if you put a tungsten cone or a, a tungsten bead on the head of it. It won't change the action that much. Okay, that's it for now, but everybody's telling me thanks for doing this. Okay, well, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and then you can also use, this is grizzly, not black, but you can also use neck hackle for woolly buggers. And, you know, this is, in a cape like this, you have all your nice dry fly stuff down in here. Um, this is a place to use all those big feathers at the top of a neck hackle that you wouldn't ordinarily use that kind of kind of go to waste unless you're tying streamer flies. Um, so, uh, you know, if you've got a neck, if you've got neck hackle, if you've got capes, you can use this stuff up at the top. Okay. One of the problems, if you have saddle capes, one of the problems with a saddle cape is that most of the feathers are going to be the same length. So if you have a good saddle cape, for tying woolly buggers, it'll probably only tie two sizes. Whereas if you have a, a neck cape like this, you're going to be able to tie down from the very smallest all the way up to the very largest. So it gives you a wide range of sizes. Saddles don't give you the same range of sizes. And if you buy, if you buy a pack of saddle hackle, honestly, it's almost um, luck of the draw. You know, um, Saddle hackle it usually isn't sized for streamers, and you may get some for some size and not for other sizes. Uh, I think the only way around that is to buy a couple packs of saddle hackle because usually they're not all from the same batch, and you you'll get different sizes. Saddle hackle is not that expensive, so if you're going to tie a wide range of sizes, probably need to buy two or three packs of saddle hackle unless you got a cape. Would that part of the saddle also be good for wax? Manuel. Yes, that part of the saddle will also be good for wets if it's the right length. But hen hackle might be better, particularly wets are going to wet flies are going to be smaller. When you get into the smaller feathers on these mo, mo, these dry fly capes, they're going to be too stiff for most soft hackles. So if you're tying small wet flies, you're probably better off um, uh, getting some some hen capes which will give you the nice soft webby feathers. All right, uh, shall we tie? Everybody ready? Everybody's gonna tie with me, right? You're all sitting down at your vise. Ted Putnam, do you have your fly tying vise there? Is Ted there? I'm not sure. Ted was on my own page earlier. Okay, so I am going to readjust uh, the camera and readjust the lights, so bear with me. Uh, you may get seasick for a minute when I move things around, so just hang on, and uh, we'll start to tie. Say hi, Robin. Hello. <laughs> oh, I bet you're getting dizzy now. Yeah, yeah. Just look away. <laughs> you caught me unaware. Just look away. Sorry, I'll give you a warning next time.
definitely getting busy. Oh, there we go. Now I'll put a background here so that it's less cluttered. How does that look? I'm going to move this because I can't see it. I'm going to move my phone just a little bit. Oops. Oh, I can't do that. Matthew said, I don't have the materials because they're in lockdown and can't buy it. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, folks, if you, if you don't have the materials, don't forget that um, you can order the stuff online, and you know a lot of your a lot of your fly shops are really suffering these days because obviously they don't have any business, and most fly shops um, have an online presence. So, uh, Orvis is uh, our warehouse is still up and running, and fly shops are also um, a lot of them are selling online. So. Um, you can get materials. Any other questions at this point? How does that look? Good light? No. Joe just said hi from Vancouver Island. Hi, Joe. He said, this is awesome. Just finished filling up an Orvis tacky dry dropped box with buggers of every size and color. Okay, so I'm going to tie on a size 6 hook. It's a ring eye. You probably you might have a down eye. I'm using a ring eye. I kind of like these ring eye hooks. Um, no difference. No, I don't think there's much difference in hooking or action or anything like that. Uh, just just a matter of aesthetics. And I'm gonna put a cone. First thing I'm gonna do is put a cone on the head of the hook. So I'm trying to. I'm trying to see. Okay. <laughs> I'm behind the camera. I'm trying to make sure that you guys can see this. So um, you're gonna put the you're gonna put the point of the hook through the narrow end of the cone and slip it around the bend. Now, cones are often hard to get on the bend, around the bend, and what it often does is it debarbs the hook or gives you a kind of a micro barb, which is cool. You may have trouble, you may have trouble on your uh, smaller flies. I'm gonna get that in focus. You may have trouble on your smaller flies getting the cone around the bend of the hook because cones are, cones are kind of tough to slip on there. And if you do, uh, just use a bead. Just use a, just use a tungsten bead instead of the cone because I have, I have problems with a lot of my 4x long you know uh even a small cone on a size 12 um streamer hook doesn't uh it doesn't go around the bend so uh you know if you can't can't get a cone around the bend just use a big uh, good size uh tungsten bead all right so i'm gonna put this <laughs> in the vise So now we have the hook and the vise with the cone. It's moving around, um, but we're gonna jam. You could put a drop of head cement or super glue if you're a super glue fan there right now. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> Dave asks, is there a guide for cones or beads based on hook size? Uh, yeah, there should be. Uh, on the Google machine, just Google, Google cone and hook size, or it may be on the Orvis site somewhere. Um, aside from the ease of tying, is there much difference between a cone head versus tungsten bead? No, it's e it's kind of easier with a tungsten bead than a cone, but uh, I, I kind of like the cones. I, I do both. You can see I've got, um, I got the same, the same fly here with a bead on it, tungsten bead. You can put two beads on there too if you want. Would bending the hook to help get the bead on damage the integrity of the hook? No, you don't want to bend the hook. You don't want to bend the hook. Just just put a bead on it. Don't don't start bending hooks. You're going to weaken them. So I wouldn't anyway. Are there long jig style hooks if you wanted to tie a bugger jig style 
point up to avoid getting hung up on the bottom when fishing the heat? As far as I know, there are no long jig hooks. Uh, there may be in the bait industry, uh, you know, uh, made for rubber worms and stuff like that. Uh, but you could just tie you could tie on a, a bigger jig hook and just um, have a shorter shorter bodied woolly bugger. Hi Roger Bird, I saw you there. I'm... <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start. You ready? I have uh, size three uh, O or one hundred and forty denier black thread, and I'm just gonna start that thread. Why did that go out of focus? I'm going to start that thread behind the cone, like so. And I'm just going to, just going to wind a bunch of thread in there. Um, I'm going to start to bulk it up there because I don't want that cone to slide back later. So I'm just winding. Just wind him back and forth. That cone's still going to slip down, but uh, I'm going to build up more materials there um, so it will be better. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do on this simple bugger, we're not going to put any wire on the body, is I'm just going to wind my thread back to the bend. Very important that you go all the way to the point where the bend just starts to starts to um, move down because if you tie your uh, marabou more forward here it's gonna it's gonna foul around the bend of the hook okay so we're hanging out there and I am going to select a marabou feather you can't see me doing this sorry about that or two, you know, if I don't, I got a good one here. So that's a good looking marabou feather for, for this. And I'm going to measure it. I want it to be about the length of the shank. So I'm gonna measure it here. And then I'm gonna just switch hands and transfer it to my other hand so that I'm holding the feather like that. Then, I'm going to just hold that right above the bend, and I'm just going to come over the top. You don't even need to do a pinch wrap. Just pull straight down. Wind, start to wind forward. So now I've got that marabou in place. Actually, it's not far back, back far enough, so I'm just going to come back and just wind it. I want to make sure that it's right where the bend starts to it's kind of it's kind of clunky sitting behind the the phone here and uh, trying to trying to do this. The next thing you're going to do, you're going to question? Oh, Larry asked, do you only get one fly from that feather? Yes, Larry, I only get one fly from this feather. <laughs> Now we're gonna. This stuff is gonna be cut away, and I suppose you could find something to use it for, like you could dub a body with it. But marabou's cheap, and uh, I'm I'm not that thrifty. So, all right. So the next thing we're gonna do is gonna bring our scissors, and this is gonna be tough because of where the camera is. I'm gonna bring my scissors right even with the bead. I'm gonna. I'm going to hold my scissors up against the bead, and then I'm just going to cut the marabou there. And then, Larry, if you want to use this, I'll mail you. I'll mail you a whole bunch of them. Stuff a pillow. <laughs> yeah, you can stuff a pillow. No, you want some of these? I'll send them to you. I'm sure you can figure out something to do with them, but I don't know what. Um, why do you not strip or cut the fiber away from the feathers? Why do I not strip or cut the fiber away from the feathers? Uh, because this is the way it works. <laughs> I don't know. I, there's no reason to strip or cut the fiber. You want that whole tip of the marabou. You don't, you don't want to strip anything out. You want that whole tip. All right, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wet my fingers. You don't have to do this. And get that marabou. And don't worry if it looks sloppy. And then I'm going to... 
I'm going to kind of spiral the thread around this marabou and I'm going to inch my fingers forward like this. I'm going to try to keep it on top just because, I don't know, just because it looks neater. And so now I got a kind of a mess there. But now, now that I've got that bound down, I can just go back and forth and even this out. And now that marabou feather is never, ever coming out. Ever, 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 okay? That's tight. And you don't have to worry about these little fuzzies or having a tapered body when you're working with chenille, so not a big deal. All right, so now I'm going to go back, and this is important. I'm going to go back to that initial tie-in point. Everything gets tied in at that same point right there. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a feather because you want to tie these in the reverse order that you're going to wind them forward. So I'm going to grab a saddle hackle. And what I do is I kind of, I kind of fan a feather around the fly to figure out what size and I don't I don't personally don't like my woolly bugger hackle that long I like my woolly bugger hackle to be about you know one and a half to two times the hook gap I don't I don't like you've I've seen them with hackle that goes way down to here and um, I don't like that not that it not that it's nothing anything wrong with it and it might not catch fish better. It's just the way I do it and, and how it looks good to me. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this feather. And we're going to hold it at the very tip. And we're going to gently stroke all of these fibers down like this. Get them out of the way. Hopefully you have a feather that's long enough. And you can see, you can see the web. You can see there's a lot of web in there, which is what I like. The next thing I'm gonna do is I am going to pull back those fibers so that, that tip is left sticking out like that. I'm gonna cut the tip and I'm going to, oh, this is hard to do at this angle. <laughs> I'm gonna just trim those fibers what that leaves what that leaves me with I'm trying to get this into focus what this leaves me with is a nubby a nubby little thing a nubby little thing that's a technical term by the way the nubby little thing um the nubby little thing uh is going to keep this feather from from pulling out and you always want to everybody's going to ask me or some people are going to ask me why don't you tie it in by the butt um, because it, it folds better and it, it winds a lot easier if you, um, there, that's better. I'm, tr I'm learning this autofocus on this camera where it, where, where it does it. Okay, so I'm going to take that, that thing, that little nubby thing, and I'm going to not tie the feather in directly. I'm going to give myself a little bit of, a little bit of leeway there. If you can see what I'm doing, I'm tying it in and I'm giving, whoops, that's what happens. All right, so I'm going to grab it again and get those fibers out of the way. John asks, have you ever tried some flashaboo? Yes, one? yes, I have, and we're going to put some flashaboo on the next one. All right, so now I'm going to take really tight turns and I'm going to go in. I'm going to go forward just enough to cover that hackle. Now, when I wind this, it's not going to pull out. Okay, so I'm not going to I'm not going to get to a point where I wind my body and then uh, my hackle pulls out and I have to start over again. I'm also going to trim this away because, you know, if I've, you see that little you see that little fiber there, see that little fiber sticking out right there. If you don't if you don't trim that off, a trout would never take this fly. Just kidding. 
Okay, so next <clears throat> we're going to tie in the chenille. If I can find it. Now, if you have this more modern style vernil or ultra chenille, what you're going to do is take about, depending on the size fly, I don't know, four or five inches of chenille. And you're just going to, you can't, in old style chenille, I'll show you in a minute, you can't do that kind of stuff. So you're just going to tie in a little nib there. If you can see that, just a little nib. And put a lot of pressure in it. If you put enough pressure on it, you're not going to form any bulk there. Okay, but I'm not, I'm going to use old-fashioned chenille, which a lot of you probably have, so I'm going to unwind that and grab my old-fashioned chenille. Craig asks, thoughts on tying the hackle in at the front, then capturing at the back with wire or mono and cross-wrapping? Yeah. That like a yeah you could do you could do that yep you could do that I think this is a little more secure honestly but yeah you could tie you could tie it in at the front wind back and then go forward with a with a wire um, similar to the way you'd tie a um, stimulator all right so this is that old style chenille and if you put your thumbnails in here and pull you're gonna expose these threads, see those threads there? And then you're gonna just tie that in, tie those threads in, so you don't have any bulk. And you're gonna really put some pressure on there. Don't be afraid to really reef down on that so that it's not gonna come out. Okay, now you're gonna take your thread and go back to the front, right tight against that cone and you're gonna let it hang there. Then you take your chenille, and um, to make that chenille look a little nicer, what you can do is twist it. I don't know, counterclockwise, clockwise, I don't know. Give it a twist, and it'll look nicer when you wind it. And you wanna, you wanna kinda cover that Kind of hold on to your tail and cover that tie-in point, and then just wind it forward in, in uh, you know, touching barely touching turns. You can keep twisting as you wind. Keep twisting that chenille to give it that nice fuzzy look. You have to be careful though, because where you twist it, you're going to lose fiber. So you have to twist it far enough down, and then jam that. Don't be afraid to jam that chenille right up into that cone. That's one of the things that's going to help you uh, keep the cone from slipping back. And then take three very tight turns to tie it off. Tie it off. And then give yourself some more turns of thread, nice tight turns of thread to make sure that that chenille is really secured in there. It'll start to creep under that cone. Now that cone's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay there. All right, probably the hardest part in the woolly bugger. Any questions at this point? No, I think everybody's tying. Everybody's tying? Are you really tying? <laughs> Roger Bird, are you really tying? Mike, are you really tying? Huh? Answer me, guys. <laughs> oh, he gave me a thumbs up. Okay. They're going to watch the YouTube, YouTube video. After. Yeah. All right. So, uh, hmm, 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 hmm. there is a dull side and a shiny side to these hackles, and it's sometimes tough to tell with a saddle hackle. But you're going to hold this hackle up like this and just kind of fold all the fibers to the rear. They're not going to go that well. And then you're going to fold the hackle over. The nice thing about tying in by the tip is this hackle is going to tend to sweep back toward the bend instead of the other way around. 
and so you can. That everyone's going to watch for his tie later. Yeah, and you can, and you can, you can kind of help it along. You know, just keep folding that and pushing that back, and twist the hackle a little bit to get make sure. And then on when you get on the far side, twist it a little bit more to make sure that that hackle. is sweeping back it's going to help the sink rate it's going to you know you could tie it reverse style so that it's so that it's cupped forward um and it, who knows it might it might work better uh, i don't like the looks of it that's why i don't tie it that way and get you know give give yourself a few extra turns if you have the hackle if you still have some Give yourself a few extra turns at the head there to kind of form a collar, especially because you're now getting into that web. All right, so, and then hold your hackle tight and take about three turns over the top of the hackle. Whoops, sorry about that. Nice tight turns. Make sure you got some tension on there. Trim that hackle tip. Like so. And then take your fingers and sweep the hackle back to get it out of the way. And now jam that thread right in there. Just build it up. This is going to give you a little more security. And it's also going to hold that cone in place. All right. So there it is. The completed basic woolly bugger. And now I'm going to whip finish. Right behind the bee, right behind the cone. Cut or slice or break your thread. Now, very important, and this is a place where um, where I really like head cement as opposed to super glue or um, UV resin. I can't get my head cement open. Oh, boy. I'll open another one. And I like, uh, I like deep penetrating head cement. Oh, boy. I can't open my head cement, so I'm going to have to ask Robin to open them for me. There. I got one open. And take your dubbing needle and let that, let that deep penetrating head cement soak into there let it soak back into the chenille and the hackle mark's wondering where the sally hansen's is i don't like sally hansen's it smell i don't like the way sally hansen smells you used it though huh i use it but yeah. uh i don't use it a lot and you know i would maybe give, even give it two coats of head cement it's going to keep that bead from slipping and it's going to, that deep penetrating, especially that deep penetrating head cement is going to seep back into that hackle and um, support it and keep it from pulling out. So that is the bugger. Any questions at this point? Now we'll tie a, uh, we'll tie a, um, we'll tie a fancier version. What do you think? Everybody into a, sure. do we have um, time? We, yeah, we got time. Raymond had a good comment. Yes. This demo was so realistic. It wasn't a 30 second woolly bugger that a beginner wouldn't be able to follow. It's great for people to see that getting started on a new flag may take some time. Yeah, great. So, what does Aaron Camp say? I can't get my head cement open. I can't read the rest of it. In a non-fly tying context, probably Mark's a person. <laughs> <laughs>
I know. As soon as I start writing it, it moves. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. I found an old lobster claw cracker. Works great for stuck head cement. Oh, I'll try that. Okay, so we're going to get rid of that sucker. Another one in my fly box. Thank you guys for allowing me to tie. And um, let's start. We'll do the same fly, but we'll do it differently. So I've got, I got my uh, hook. How's the light? The light good there? Can everybody see when I... There's not, not too much shadow or anything. Does it all look, uh, the camera autofocus sometimes. Wish, wish these phones worked on manual focus. I am going to try to, uh, to set up my DSLR, um, if I can get parts to, uh, try to set it up with a DSLR. It'll be, we'll be able to get closer. I'm not. That's what I'm going to do next. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do next. Okay, so we're going to tie a fancier or more complicated woolly bugger. So I got my, I got my um, cone on there. It could be a bead. doesn't matter. And then I'm going to take some lead-free wire. Oh, that's oval tinsel. That's no good. <laughs> my fly tying desk is already messy. All right, I'm going to take some lead-free wire and I'm going to start eh, back here somewhere and I'm going to wind that right from the spool. And you don't have to cover the whole shank if you don't want to. This won't cover the whole shank anyways. I'm going to wind it right up to the bead. I'm going to break it there. I'm going to break it there. And then I am going to take my fingernails and jam that up inside the, the cone. So I've got a little extra weight there, and I built up a little more taper in the front. Okay? Mark asks, can you also tie a leech pattern? Uh, you know what? I can someday, Mark, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. My family wants me to wants me to uh, to w work out and have dinner and take a hike later. So uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to be here all day. We, we may we may be able to tie a leech someday. All right. So, little dubbing wax on head cement jar thread drying shot. Oh, good tip, Matt. Good tip. I'm going to try that. All right. So, um. I'm going to start here. I'm going to start my thread behind that waiting wire. Like right here. And what this is going to do is keep that, obviously, keep that wire from slipping back. And then I just like to, I just like to spiral back and forth through the wire a few times just to make sure it doesn't rotate. You could put head cement or super glue on here now. I don't think you need it. All right. So that is the start. Now we're going to add a schnarzel. I bet none of you know what a schnarzel is. A, sh a schnarzel, I got that term from Dave Mangum, and I'm not sure it's, it's, if it's an official term or it's what Dave Mangum calls it, but a schnarzel is a, is a foul guard. And what I've got is a piece of stiff monofilament. I had uh, 17 thousandths, 25 pound test uh, fluorocarbon. And I am going to double this schnarzel over and I am going to I'm going to make it so that I'm going to hold it here so that it, it forms a loop at the end. And I'm going to tie it in. I'm going to try to keep each piece on the side if I can. Mike asks, what gauge waiting wire do you prefer? Uh, what gauge? I prefer the gauge that I have on my fly tying desk that isn't too big and isn't too small. Let me see what it is here. Uh, 
I have 0 0.020. This is a size six hook though. So there is your, your schnarzel. Probably should be a little wider. I'll try to pull it. So what what that does is it just it helps to keep from that marabou from fouling around the bend of the hook. Okay, so we're gonna cut this off here, and now I'm gonna again tie in my marabou tail. Can y'all see that schnarzel there? See what it looks like. I wonder if schnarzel is really a bad word. I hope it's not. Oh, there's a nice marabou feather. Oh, that's a beauty. Maybe I'll use two. Okay, this is going to be a nice full. So what I'm going to do is I got two marabou feathers here, and there's a little curvature on them. What I'm going to do is put, that, put those curvatures so that the concave sides are together. And I'm going to line them up like so and that's going to give me a really full bushy tail maybe too much but we'll see now i'm going to measure that again about a shank length or so i'm going to tie this in on top of the schnarzel take a few turns nice and tight Nice and tight. Okay. So see, that's going to have trouble, a lot more trouble fouling. Uh, and then I'm going to cut these, cut these off even with the bead or the, the cone. Wet it. You don't have to wet it, but I know it's creepy to put saliva on a marabou thing, but too bad. Okay, so that's nice and secure. And now... Dave is asking, would bringing the thread up and under the tail several times to hold it up also work? It might. I haven't tried that. It might, try, it might do it. I think the schnarzel works better. Um, blow, pulling it up and going under there. Yeah, it might, but it would... It might cock the tail up at too much. Okay, now somebody asked about somebody asked about uh, uh, sparkle stuff. I don't like a lot of I don't like a lot of sparkle in my woolly buggers. I don't like a lot of sparkle in my streamers, unless I'm doing so, fishing something like acrylics where where you want it to be really sparkly. But um, I got two strands of of crystal flash here and see if I can do this do this with one all right so I got I got crystal flash looped around the thread I'm going to just take a couple turns and then I'm going to pull them off to each side so they come down the middle of the marabou. You could tie these in separately if you want to. Doesn't matter. Now look at the other side. And I probably want that down a little lower, so I'm gonna pull that and just get the thread scooched in there. There, that's a little better. Oh, now the other side screwed up there. Okay. And then I'm going to just cut these even with the tail. So now you've got your little flash there for those of you who like the flash. I don't like much flash on my flies, most of my flies. Um, and next, we're going to take a piece of wire. This is black ultra wire, but you could use anything you want. You want a little color accent, you might put red or something like that in there. And where's my wire cutters? Here they are, wire cutters.
and I'm going to tie a piece of wire in there. Right again at that same tie-in spot. Everything gets tied in the same place. There's the wire. Just going to let that hang. And I'm going to grab a saddle hackle. We need two cameras for this. That's what we need. We need a two camera setup. Yeah, that's good. I'm measuring that. That's about where I like it. I don't like it too long. I'm going to do that. Do that. Just pulling those back to get them out of the way. I don't want that whole feather because I don't want that. I don't want a lot of that shiny stuff. And I'm going to cut that. Cut that. Any questions? Not right now. So you got your little nubbins. There's the nubbins. Another technical term. I'm going to tie that in. Nice and tight. Give it some good turns. And then I'm going to find my chenille and wind that. So what we've done different on this one is we put, we put underwire waiting, and we put a schnarzel on it, and we put flash, and then we're going to use a wire counter rib. So... Um, this is the fancy, this is a full dress woolly bugger, as they say in Atlantic salmon fishing. Jake asked, what size wire do you like to counter wrap with? Uh, I don't care. Whatever wire you got. It's, you know, it's, it, I don't like it too heavy, unless you got a, if you, if you have um, an accent, uh, you want an accent color, maybe you make it a little finer in diameter, but this is, or a heavier diameter, this is really fine. I don't particularly want this to show. So um, this wire is just gonna keep the fish teeth from uh, breaking the hackle. What type and size thread again? Last Mike. Thread, yeah. what tying thread do you use? I am using, uh, I am using Warvis or Wapsi, same thing, uh, 140 denier on this size six, or uh, 3.0. And if I were tying a 10 or 12, I'd probably be using a 6.0 or 70 denier thread. Okay, so now I'm going to wind the chenille. I'm going to twist it again. And make sure I cover up that initial tie-in point because if the fish, if trout or any fish see the thread wraps in the back there, they will not take this fly. They will absolutely not take it. You cannot ever leave thread wraps exposed in the back. <laughs> so again, you wanna jam that chenille right up against that cone, fill it up, fill up that little spot in there. Two turns is probably enough with chenille. The nice thing about chenille is it's never going anywhere. Couple turns to secure it. Now we're gonna wind the hackle, same, same way we did before. We're gonna get that wire out of the way, make sure it's not twisted around the hackle. And I'm gonna try to make this hackle behave and fold the way I want it to. Doesn't always, doesn't always work out. Come on, there you go, there you go. Get that hackle to fold back. Now it's starting to twist on me. So. Victoria from Vancouver Island asks, would you choose a darker bead instead of gold or brass for a darker or natural colored fly? It is totally up to you, Victoria. It is totally up to you. Uh, I would try it both ways. I am a kind of a, 
as Robin can tell you, I'm kind of a non-flashy guy, <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> so I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I like black beads often, um, unless I really want a, an attractor. Um, I like black cones or, or dull colored cones. I think that fish see an awful lot of flash. And I think that sometimes they shy away from it. What other materials do you like to use for this tail? For the tail, there is not a, there is not a big substitute for marabou in this fly. Um, the you could use a, a rabbit strip if you wanted to, which it wouldn't be a woolly bugger. Then it would be a zonker. Do you use a rabbit strip? Piece of rabbit strip. Um, I have used ostrich hurl, but the problem is that you need a big bunch of ostrich hurl to make a tail on a woolly bugger, and it's kind of it's kind of expensive. We've got a series of questions here. Okay, I'm gonna well, uh, I'm gonna just take a couple turns here to secure that hackle and then answer some questions. Okay. Christy asked, "Can you explain the knot at the end? I just always mess it up. Thanks." Can I what? <laughs> explain the knot on at the end. The best way the best way to learn the knot at the end is to go on uh, the internet and look up how to do a whip finish. Okay, um, there there are there are lots better ways of demonstrating it than I can do here live, and there are lot there are lots of people like Tim Flagler, um, Tightline Productions, who have done um, really well produced videos, well lit close up videos that will show you how to do it. So um, we're kind of just going through a pattern here. Um, I don't I don't want to try to teach teach how to do a whip finish here. Because there are better resources for that than what I can do here. Roger asks, are you trying to get the hackle in between the chenille wraps? Not really. No, Roger. Just just kind of winding it. Just kind of spiraling, spiraling in. The chenille wraps are touching, so there isn't really much. There isn't much um, a gap between them. And if you get if you get the hackle down in between the chenille wraps, it tends to stick out at ninety degrees. And I want it to sweep back a little bit instead of, so um, I tried that the other day. I tried to wind the chenille in looser coils and then spiraled the hackle through the gaps in the chenille, but uh, I didn't like the way it looked. Okay, Aaron asks, what's your dream scenario for fishing this particular bugger? Color, size, weight, species, water type, where would, you, where would this fly do best? Um, this fly, this fly, this fly would do best in, um, well, it would do best wherever smallmouth bass swim. It is, it, I think it is the best smallmouth bass pattern, a black woolly bugger. Uh, for trout, I would use this in, um, rising slightly dirty water on a cloudy day. Dave asks, what about using peacock sword for the tail? I've used it, but doesn't undulate like marabou. Yeah, you could use peacock sword, but yeah, it wouldn't. And it, you have to use a lot of peacock sword to it. Again, like ostrich trail, it would get expensive. You can, you, can, you can make this out of anything. Oh, trivia question that I didn't, that I didn't mention before is, do you all know where marabou comes from? Used to come from a marabou stork um, back in the early days, but we don't kill marabou storks for <laughs> tying flies. Um, this material comes from the armpit of a domestic turkey <laughs> or chicken or a large chicken, but mostly turkeys. And I've, uh, um, you know, if you shoot, if you're, if you're a hunter and you shoot any kind of birds, most birds will have a fuzzy marabou-like uh, fiber on them. Okay, just one more question. Craig was asking what the hook size was. The hook is a size six. But um, again, we can tie us on any. But I gotta finish this fly. We're not done yet. We're not. So the the wire, the um I'm gonna counter rib this wire. So normally we wind away from ourselves, right? But if I wound this wire the the normal way through there, it wouldn't catch the um the hackle fibers or stems at an angle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back wind. I'm going to counter rib and I'm going to kind of wiggle this through here so that I don't, 
bind down my fibers. And so I'm winding toward me. I'm we call back winding. And I like to take a couple of turns just to make sure. And then I'm going to carefully tie that wire off. So that wire is invisible. You could, if you wanted to, you could use a, you know, a red wire or something like that. Oh, I need a new pair of pliers. You have to be careful when you when you backwind like that because your thread is kind of going your thread is kind of going in the opposite direction that it should to bind that down, so you have to really really secure it. So that is a that is a woolly bugger with a schnarzel and a little crystal flash and a counter rib. So that's the advanced, the full dress woolly bugger. And I'm going to whip finish it. Sorry, Victoria, I'm not gonna do a tutorial on this, but there's again, there's lots of places you can find it. Oh. And we'll put some head cement on there and it's done. Any other questions? Um, Nicolette asks, how long have you been at Orvis? I have, remember it. <laughs> I have been at Orvis for 43 and a half years. And Adam says, I have this ingredient, Strict Boost Rainbow. It looks like the flashy stuff you have, but seems more fragile. I hear you that pers personal expression is encouraged, but what is the best use for this ingredient? I don't know what that is. Hmm. What is it? What is it again? Strip Goose Rainbow. Strip Goose Rainbow. Sounds like it might be a biot material for making like quill bodies on on fly. I don't. I never heard of Strip Goose Rainbow. Sorry, <laughs> I can't help you. Lots of head cement. What's the benefit of ribbing? Uh, that wire rib, uh, often, um, particularly if you're um, catching brown trout, which have really sharp teeth, or very large brook trout, um, they have sharp teeth, and they'll and they'll cut the hackle, and um, the hackle will unwind and come off the end. Um, if that happens to you, if your hackle does um, fall apart or fall off, just take take the hackle and pull it off or cut it off, and then you've got a leech. So you don't have the hackle here, but you still got that chenille body and the marabou, and um, you know it'll it'll work uh, maybe even better than it would with the hackle. So if the hackle falls off, um, don't worry about it. Uh, just fish it as a leech, which would that's that would be a leech. Basically, this fly, if we didn't put the hackle on it, would be a leech. Um, and um, but that that counter rib wire was to keep the sharp teeth of of trout from cutting. That hackle stem is probably the most the most vulnerable part of this fly to um, falling apart is the the hackle stem that went through the body. So we're reinforcing that with the wire. Okay. Any other <laughs> any other any other questions? We've gone over our time. No more questions, but everybody likes it and wants you to keep doing it. Well, thank you very much, Roger Bird. <laughs> Roger Bird, how come you have a thing that says top fan at the top of your uh, little bubble there? <laughs> would you add a red hot spot? I don't know. Would you? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Play with it. Experiment. I probably wouldn't add a red hot spot, but, um, you know, you might. And... It might work better than my flies. All right, guys. I am going to sign off now. Um, it's almost wine time. <laughs> and, it starts early during the coronavirus yeah. time. All right, everyone. See ya. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Um, it's been fun. It's been fun hanging out with all of you. And, um, you know, we're going to try to do this three times a week. So um, I hope you learned something or at, or at least you were entertained today. Uh, 
and uh, we'll be doing, I think, the Rusty Spinner on Wednesday. We're going to do a dry fly, which might which might be a challenge because um, it's smaller. But uh, signing off now, and um, stay healthy, everyone, and thanks for tuning in.